When he is good to his people, he's our great friend. His every word and act is for our good. Therefore, it's wise to listen to God and his Christ. And for those who do and rightly respond to his love, he brings into his house as his friend, takes him into his confidence, and teaches his purposes. Then the King Christ Jesus assigns them a ministry, a place in his organization. On last Wednesday, 4,640 new brothers were immersed. We welcome them to our ranks as Jehovah's ministers. And now to help us all treasure this great assignment as the biggest job of our lives, a deep discourse will be given on requirements necessary for ministry by Brother A. H. McMillan. Brother McMillan has served with the society since the year 1900, the turn of the century. Many here today are grandchildren of those whom he served years ago. He is still sticking to his work being presently assigned at WBBR, the New World Radio Station. So now is your pleasure to hear one of Jehovah's Witnesses whom we affectionately call our Brother Mac. Brother Mac. In carrying out his eternal purposes, Jehovah uses creatures with the requirements necessary to accomplish their assignments. He used the Logos, his only beloved son, as a master workman to perform his will in creating all other things. After man rebelled against Jehovah, it was not long until the world became so wicked, Jehovah determined to destroy that system of things by a mighty flood of waters. In order to save the few righteous people on earth and certain animals, a large vessel had to be prepared. But who would be used to do this great work? A righteous man named Noah was found. This man, together with his family, carried out the divine command, even if they were not shipbuilders to begin with. They sure were shipbuilders when they ended up building that ark. They were devoted to Jehovah and had the necessary requirements to carry out his will. Later, when Jehovah would deliver Israel from Egyptian bondage and lead them to the land of promise, some competent person was needed to undertake this mission. Moses was selected. He was born of Hebrew parents, but was brought up in the royal courts of Pharaoh and was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. When called, Moses made several feeble excuses, saying he was not a good speaker and could not make a good impression on Pharaoh. Jehovah was displeased with him for this, but told him he would be with him on the journey. So Moses obeyed the command and went on the mission and performed it well. For Jehovah to accept an excuse from one sent on a mission, would be equal to saying he did not know the limitations of the one called, a thing impossible for our God, who is infinite in wisdom. So obedience is better than excuses. When the time came to introduce the Messiah to the nation of Israel, Jehovah did not call one of the self-righteous scribes or Pharisees, nor one of the proud priests for this service. These had set aside the word of God and accepted the traditions of men. Therefore, they would not be equipped for this service. He selected a man of humble circumstances who did not attend the rabbinical schools at Jerusalem, but one who spent his youth in diligent study of God's word, not in the large cities, but in the quiet of the wilderness. He was called John the Baptist, a man well prepared for his work, which he began at the age of 30 years. Six months after the birth of John the Baptist, Jesus was born at Bethlehem, as foretold by the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. From his youth, Jesus was preparing for his ministry. There are records in the libraries of Rome and Constantinople which claim to be authentic 
and they give interesting observations about Jesus' youth in Nazareth. It is said he took no interest in the questions of the day nor in politics. He made no effort to deliver the children of Israel from the Roman yoke. His interests were wholly in the word of God and his kingdom. He talked about these on every occasion. Mary, his mother, was surprised at this, as she well remembered. The angel Gabriel told her before his birth that he would be given the throne of his father David and would reign forever. Of course, she was looking for the literal throne of David to be restored with her son as king. For this reason, she wondered why he did not take more interest in being a king. It said she called this to his attention at one time, and he answered, Woman, you do not know who I am. Jesus knew he was, who he was and what his mission to earth was. Now, the ministry of John and Jesus, preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, seemed strange to the Israelites, for they were looking for the restoration of the throne of David and not a spiritual kingdom such as John and Jesus preached. Another matter that perplexed some of the people was that John preached the forgiveness of sins through baptism. For over 1,500 years, the Jews carried on an elaborate system of sacrifices and services in the tabernacle and later in the temple, the purpose of which was to have their sins set aside and thus be kept in the favor of Jehovah under the law covenant arrangement. For John to teach that sins would be forgiven by baptism was more than the religious leaders could take. Many of the common people, however, accepted John as a prophet and came to him for baptism. Teachers of the Jewish religion did not realize that the sacrifices offered year by year in the temple did not take away their sins. Even the disciples could not understand why Jesus must die before his kingdom would go into operation. They wanted him to become a king at once. Today we have the opposite condition to meet. False religion has long taught that the people would be saved must go to heaven. All the rest would be tormented forever. And finally, the earth would be burned up. However, God's message for the people today is a kingdom that will fill the earth with the glory of God and thus make it a paradise of pleasure where righteous men and women will live forever praising Jehovah. Now, Jesus was thoroughly equipped for his ministry. He studied the word of God carefully and remembered all that he read and followed the instructions written therein. He gathered about him many disciples and trained them for the ministry. He took them with him in the service from village to village, city to city, and house to house, showing them how to teach the people. Later, he sent them out by twos to gain personal experiences in the field. The men he thus trained became faithful ministers fully equipped for the service. Take Peter, for instance. He was a fisherman. He was not trained in any of the rabbinical schools in Jerusalem to become a great speaker. Nevertheless, on the day of Pentecost, he preached to a large gathering in Jerusalem, and 3,000 were converted to Christianity and later baptized. Yes, Peter was well prepared for the ministry. After Pentecost, the kingdom message spread rapidly to the chagrin of the master's opponents. Some prominent men accepted the message and became followers of Christ and preached to others. Among these was a brilliant young man from Tarsus called Saul, whose name was changed to Paul. This man had a marvelous experience which brought about his conversion to the truth. While on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians, he was given a glimpse of the glorified Christ who told him he was a chosen vessel to carry the message of salvation to many people. Paul entered the ministry with great zeal. In his travels, he visited the city of Athens, Greek. He tried to instruct the Jews living there, but found no interest. Then he went to the marketplace where the noted philosophers met to discuss topics of interest with their students and other people. You see, Athens was then supposed to be the center of education and culture of the worldly type. 
Paul, on the other hand, represented the truth as taught by Jesus, the Savior of mankind. He came from Jerusalem, where Jehovah was pleased to put his name. His visit to Athens, however, was not an accident, although he had no definite appointment there. He was there waiting for his companions to continue their journey in other places. In his discussion with the philosophers in Athens, he encountered the Epicureans, who believed in many gods, but did not think they took much notice of what humans did. Oh, just satisfy all the appetites of the senses was their idea of how to live. Then there were the Stoics, who thought all life's interests were controlled by fate. Both of these groups disliked Paul, evidently because they could not meet his arguments nor answer his questions as they discussed Jesus and the resurrection. So to, to humiliate him, one of these wise men called Paul a rag picker. Now think of that. That's found in the Goodspeed translation of Acts 17, verse 18. This name was given him in disdain. The term meant a crow that would go about picking up seeds along the way. So they would say this wandering Jew picks up bits of knowledge along his journeys and then puts them together, claiming great wisdom. How to silence him was the question. Now what did they do? Paul was arrested and brought to the area Ochibus for a public hearing. There was a law at that time which read, No person shall have any strange gods nor new ones, nor shall he privately worship any strange gods unless they be publicly allowed. Evidently, it was under this statute Paul was prosecuted, as they claim he was introducing a strange god and worshiping him. If convicted, death was the penalty. So you see, the situation was serious for Paul. Now let's follow and see what happened. The Areopagus was uh, where they took Paul for his hearing, was a very prominent place in Athens. Here an audience of distinguished men and women gathered. The well-fed, well-dressed Epicureans filed in and took the conspicuous seats. After them came the Stoics with their serious faces and stern demeanor, and they would be followed by students from far and near. Now we see Judge Dionysus coming in, also some society women. All were waiting to hear what this little man from Jerusalem would say in self-defense. The record at Acts, the 17th chapter, tells us, so we quote, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Ye men of Athens, in all things I perceive you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, this I set forth unto you. What an electrifying effect this introduction had on this austere audience. In a few words, Paul completely changed the situation. The proud philosophers were now confessed ignoramuses, and Paul is the learned teacher. They publicly admitted their ignorance of this God they worship, yet Paul knew much about him and would proceed to instruct them. No doubt these philosophers would say one to another, why did we bring this fellow here to expose our ignorance? But wait, gentlemen, Paul is not through with you yet. He continues, this God whom you ignorantly worship is the God who made the world and all things therein. He being God of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with men's hands, seeing he himself giveth life and breath to all things. For in him we live, move, and have our being. As certain of your poets have said, we are his offspring. Here Paul quoted from a poem by Aratus which says, let us begin with God, that every mortal raise his voice in tune to God's endless praise. God fills the heaven, the earth, the sea, the air. We feel his spirit moving here and everywhere, and we, his offspring, are. So you see, Paul backed up his argument, not by quoting from the Hebrew prophets, whom the Athenians would not accept, 
but from their own kind. How uncomfortable these wise men of Athens were now. But wait, Paul is not through with you yet. So he proceeded. Why should men think they could make an image of this great God that would be worshipped? This time of ignorance God wicked at, or at least he overlooked. Thought that the uncomfortable philosophers really ever stop walloping us for our ignorance. They would have been glad to get out of that building unseen. But don't worry, gentlemen. Paul is about done speaking now. His closing remarks were very kindly. And if these ignorant philosophers had given heed to them, they might have gained life. So Paul concluded, this time of ignorance God winked at. But now that you're informed, you are commanded to repent because God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. For this remark about the resurrection, the philosophers undoubtedly were very glad because they thought no one in Athens of any account believed in the resurrection, so they would break up this unfortunate gathering on this issue and thus save face. But they were too late. Of course, some mocked but others believed them. And above all, Judge Dionysus. A congregation was started in Athens at that time, and there's one there today. And there are delegates at this assembly from the congregation in Athens. But where are the philosophers that were so wise at that time? They're gone and forgotten. So the culture and the education and the wisdom of this old world is rapidly passing away but the word of God held forth by the New World Society will live and abide forever. <laughs> now, you see the Apostle Paul had the requirements necessary for the ministry to handle that difficult situation that we just described. But now what are these requirements? First. One must be dedicated to Jehovah God if he hopes to be a minister acceptable to him. Serving Jehovah is a precious privilege and must be taken seriously. This service is not for a time, but for eternity. Jesus said, No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9:62. A good servant of Jehovah will give all his time and attention to his service. He cannot do many things and be a successful minister. Paul said, this one thing I do, that is preach. He did not have a law office in Jerusalem and a tent factory in Tarsus. No, he likened himself to a soldier who would not mix with the business of this world in order that he might serve his master well. Another requirement necessary for the ministry is to be a good teacher of God's Word. To this end, he must be a diligent student of the Bible. Said the Apostle, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman or a minister, that needeth not be ashamed, rightly handling the Word of Truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 now again at the same epistle, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read, All scripture is inspired of God and is beneficial for teaching, for setting things straight, that the man of God may be fully competent, completely equipped for every good work. You see, it was because of his knowledge of the Bible that Paul was able to set the philosophers in Athens straight. To be well equipped for the ministry, one must keep in close touch with all the activities of service as directed by Jehovah's organization. All company meetings will be attended if possible. All circuit and district assemblies will be supported. We should never miss a national or international gathering of Jehovah's servants. You see, back in the days of Israel, Jehovah required all males to gather at Jerusalem for their annual assemblies. These were for the benefit of the people. There they were instructed in the law and the true worship of Jehovah. 
Service and worship really mean the same thing. They go together. Who can measure the blessings we receive from this gathering? As we go to our respective fields of service, the memory of this assembly will be an inspiration as we continue our worship and service of praise to Jehovah. In times past, some wondered how the new world would get organized. As it was thought, there would be great confusion after the destructive storm of Armageddon ended. We know Jehovah is a God of order and is now training servants with the necessary requirements for service in the New World. Here is where the New World Society comes in. It's made up of the anointed remnant and their dedicated companions, and they are being equipped with the necessary requirements for service now and in the New World. They go from door to door seeking the other sheep and feeding them, that they too may join in the service of the kingdom. The prophet Isaiah refers to kingdom work at chapter 21 and verse 16 where we read, I have put my words in thy mouth and covered thee in the shadow of mine hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. Christ was placed on the throne of the new world in 1914 AD. Since that time, Jehovah's Witnesses have been preaching this good news to the peoples of the earth and thus planting in their minds the knowledge of the new heavens now established and Christ the King ruling in the midst of his enemies. They're also teaching the people the principles, rules, and regulations of the new world and urging all to live in harmony with these now. The home is the foundation upon which a nation is built. Homes are created by marriage. Satan's system of things had made a joke out of marriage, as to them it's just a matter of convenience. Jehovah's Witnesses emphasize the fact that marriage is of divine origin, it's a divine institution, and must be pure to be a success. In this way, they are laying the foundations of the new world in the minds of the new world society and urging them to live now in harmony with these rules, regulations, and principles. Further activities of uh, the ministers equipped with the necessary requirement are referred to at Isaiah chapter 32, verses 1 and 2, where we read, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. A man shall be a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, and streams of water in a dry land, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. This prophecy is fulfilled after Christ is crowned as king. The princes referred to here are not the sons of ruling monarchs on the earth. They are members of the New World Society who are captains or leaders of groups. They are on the earth and are dedicated to the king and are equipped with the requirements necessary to the ministry for which they are assigned. Having these requirements, they are able to protect the sheep from the winds of false doctrine Satan uses to confuse. They bring the clear, refreshing waters of truth now flowing from the throne of the crown king in glory to the thirsting sheep in dry lands made so by false religion. They furnish protection as a great rock in a land made weary by the wicked one. These princes or captains have been instructed in the Bible school at Gilead or in one of the theocratic ministry schools held by the many congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide. They are operating now in over a hundred countries and hours of the sea. While Satan's world is getting in more trouble by reason of juvenile delinquency, teenage mobsters, business dishonesty and governmental corruption and mismanagement, the New World Society is growing in numbers and joy in the Lord. Tens of thousands of old and young people in all lands are seeking safety and security from Earth's woes, and they find in the New World Society a people rejoicing in the knowledge of the good purposes of Jehovah with the assurance 
that the kingdom of God, for which they have long prayed, is now set up in the heavens and will soon destroy Satan and his wicked world. Now the work carried on by these ministers of Jehovah, who have the requirements necessary for the ministry, is unique. They go to the homes of the people and conduct Bible studies with all interest that they can find. This method appeals to the people because they can study the Bible in the quiet of their homes and there learn about the kingdom and the blessings it will bring them. Bible questions are discussed and answered in a manner that can be understood and be remembered. This information makes their hearts glad and they wish to join in the service. Then the witnesses take them in field service as Jesus and the apostles did, teaching them the requirements necessary for the ministry. In a short time, these become qualified ministers and thus the kingdom message reaches many peoples. So it's a great privilege to be a witness for Jehovah at this time. We note what the prophet Isaiah said about these witnesses in chapter 60, verses 1 to 3 and 8. There we read, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of Jehovah is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But Jehovah will arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the nations shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Who are these that fly as a cloud, and as doves to their windows? Here is a command from Jehovah which means the New World Society has much work ahead, and work that should make our hearts glad. Just think of it. Kings and nations will come to seek comfort and light from Jehovah's servants, whom he has appointed to serve them. For this service, they must have the necessary requirements. Now, will we have the necessary requirements for this great ministry to the nations and their rulers, who will come as clouds of doves to the windows to be fed? Now is the time to prepare for this work. Thousands of ministers will be needed. Are you interested? If so, prepare for it. Jesus said at Luke chapter 12 and verse 47, the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do that will shall be beaten with many stripes. When Jehovah applies stripes, each one will feel them, I am satisfied. Now is the time to prepare for this service. Happy is the one who has part therein. Soon it will all be over. Yes, there will be no more opportunity to suffer for Christ's sake, something the apostles said they delighted to do. Turning now to Revelation, chapter 6 and 7, we find an interesting picture of things now taking place on earth that concerns the New World Society. In the closing verses of the sixth chapter, we note the rulers of the nations and the military top-ranking ones are in great fear because they see the evidence of divine wrath before which they cannot stand. So they're looking for a place of safety. But they can find none outside of the New World Society because this old world they're trusting in is going to pieces. The seventh chapter opens by telling us the angels will hold things together until the work of sealing the 144,000 and gathering the great crowd is completed. We read in part, after this, I saw four angels standing on the four extremities of the earth, holding tight the four winds of the earth. I saw another angel ascending from the sun rising, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or any tree until we seal the slaves of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were 144,000. After this, I looked, and behold, a great cloud that came out of tribulation had palm branches in their hands, dressed in white robes, crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation we owe to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Here we have assurance that Armageddon will not break over the earth until the work mentioned here is complete. The sealing of the 144,000 is about finished. We've been at that a long time. Therefore, the special work is now 
with the great crowd. They are in tribulation because of the conditions of earth, on earth. But when they come into the New World Society, they are happy. The palm branches in their hands symbolizes their victory over the wicked one, and their white robes show they are accepted by the king. Singing the song of salvation pictures their joy in the Lord. Now this great crowd belong to the New World Society, and they're happy in the service of Jehovah, while those supporting Satan's passing system are in great distress as they look at the things they see coming on the world. So gathering this great crowd is an urgent matter in which the angels are deeply interested. Notice that. Why are they interested? Because they cannot go into action against Satan's wicked system until this great crowd is found and prayed. Do you get discouraged because there's no interest in your territory? Do you feel at times like giving up the work? Well, if there's no interest in your territory, there's much interest in heaven in what you are doing. The angels are interested because they cannot move to destroy Satan's organization until your work is done. But they're just as anxious as we are to see Satan's system destroyed. So don't keep them waiting, just holding the winds of trouble back. Finish the work, and then watch the angels go into action, getting the wicked one and his crowd out of the way, in order that the New World Society, equipped with the requirements necessary for the ministry, may increase their activities as the nucleus of the New World under the direction of Christ the King to the glory of Jehovah God.